Hey, this is Steve Zeltzer with Work Week, and I'm with Sonny Lloyd, who is a teacher at Venice High in Los Angeles, and he is in a campaign running for president of the United Teachers of Los Angeles, 30,000 members, one of the second largest teachers union in the United States, and I wanted to talk to him about the issues that he and his fellow teachers are facing, public schools, charters, privatization. Welcome to Work Week. Thank you, Steve. So, Sonny, first of all, why don't you talk about your teaching career? When did you get into teaching? I've been teaching 17 years, so I started back in 2002 uh, in a middle school, and I taught four years at Hale Middle School out in the Valley here in Los Angeles, and then I've been at uh, Venice High School for the last 13 years teaching AP government and U.S. history. Um, I really enjoy sharing my passion of social studies with with youngsters and teaching them about the world and how it works and how they can manage through the political and economic environment they're going to have to navigate over the next 80 years of their life. And what were some of the issues that got you involved in the union uh, as a union activist? Well, um, being a history teacher, um, I've I've always focused on labor history. And so from day one, I I attended union meetings. And I just understand that if if labor isn't active, if labor doesn't have a voice, they're not going to be treated well. When I first started, you see, we'd have issues of, you know, pay, class size. I mean, the class sizes were incredible when I came down to here in Los Angeles. You know, over 40 kids in a classroom no cost of living adjustments in our wages. And so it was very hard to live as a new teacher down here. You know, I had to have roommates for at least three to four years um, on and off. And, you know, you just figure you got huge student debt. You know, I, I took out about 80 grand to get a teaching credential. And um, it was just very hard to pay rent, and do basic things in life. And, um, you know, I knew that I had to throw my voice in and you know, my expertise, and, you know, we we almost had a strike within those first few years, and, you know, I remember this settlement was a a 1% pay increase with with no, no, with nothing um, to deal with class size, and I felt like, wow, leadership is really out of touch. They don't understand, you know, what we're going through with our standard of living and our work day, and they're willing to settle for so so little. 1%, it wasn't even a, a cost of living increase. So, you know, just from then on, I've I've just always stayed involved and tried to push leadership to, you know, fight harder. So, you know, and that's around the time the charter movement started to really expand in the early 2000s here in California. So I started to follow that, and, you know, I've seen L.A. become the number one charter location in the country. LAUSD is the number one charter authorizer in the nation, and, um, Again, I don't feel like our union leadership is really taking that head on. They're sort of conceding to the charter industry and, um, you know, trying to organize teachers in the charter world, but then it bets privatization. It creates a two-tier system, and there's um, all types of issues with that. Our retirement system gets drained. Um, you have workers that, that, that working without credentials and, you know, taking care of kids. You have, you know, environmental issues of where these schools are built. So just, the, um, you know, my standard of living, the teacher's profession, you know, I, I feel like that, that's so important to our democracy. It's the foundation of a democracy and, a, you know, an economy that works for everyone is a strong public education system. So uh, I hate to see the workers mistreated, and I, I hate to see privatizers, you know, continuing to make money off the backs of uh, these students. And Eli Broad, a billionaire, the Broad Foundation has been involved in training superintendents uh, who have supported charter schools. And you had the the KIPP chain that was started in Los Angeles uh, from New York, and it was welcomed by the AFT, Randy Weingarten. Why is the union welcome these charters as long as they're union? You know, I, I don't think they. It's 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 an easier road. It's the path of least resistance. You don't really have to take these people head on. You don't have to take the system head on. And, you know, it's opportunism. You, you get to, uh, you know, have them become dues-paying members, even though they really have, that they have no rights that, you know, uh, a public school teacher does that, that's in a union. So it's a way for them to sort of keep their funds coming in, and they, at the same time, they don't really have to... Uh, 
you know, go to war against the privatizers. And, you know, the war has already been waged, right? There's a war on public education. We've sort of taken a, a defensive approach to it, and, and we haven't really begun to go on the offensive. And it's, 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 it's the easy road. It creates more political connections uh, around the, the ecosystem, the, the privatizers and the unions. And, you know, people in power sort of shake hands and, and, and work together and sort of make peace with each other. And the rest of, rest of society really suffers. And you have had a series of corruption scandals, John D.C., a Ref Rodriguez. Do you think that it's endemic in this charter industry that you're going to have corruption, kickbacks, and conflicts of interest? Absolutely. I believe the charter industry, it's just the whole concept, the whole theory is flawed that you can take public money and have a private company, a corporation, or a management company you know, run it. It just sets it up for all types of schemes where, you know, you're, you you have contractors that are your friends and you're funneling money toward them for, you know, teacher training and construction. And, yeah, it's, um, it's just set up to be corrupt. And there's no really way around that. I mean, if you, you want to say make all charter schools public under the purview of public school districts, you know, that that could be a fix, but as long as as long as you allow them to exist outside of that realm, it's um, it's just a license to steal. Have a, a charter company. And Prop 39, which was passed, I think 2002, supported by Reed Hastings, uh, owner of Netflix, and it was supported by the California Federation of Teachers and the CTA. It has led to co-locations. Why don't you talk about co-locations, what Prop 39 has done to the schools in Los Angeles and the problems it's created uh, for public education? I I mean, it's just absolutely terrible. You have this uh, two-tier system, uh, you know, on the same campus. You you have three, four, you know, different schools running on the same campus. You know, a different administration, different rules, dress codes, different, even different ages. You have, you know, elementary charters on a middle school campus, things like that. And it really just, it creates a a lot of disorganization on the campus. It creates a, a system whereby the public students feel like they're being, they're being neglected, the charters, you know, they're able to they cut deals with corporations and, you know, get extra perks for their students. And, and literally, they'll see them, um, at, you know, walk right by the public school students, let's say, with fresh water that's imported in, you know, and, and you know, water stations for, you know, the charter school students. And the LAUSD, LAUSD students are drinking out of, the, you know, the, the rusty drinking fountain. You know, but that the clean water is not for them, right? It's, it's trucked in for the charter school kids. So it's just really, uh, it's a big problem. Nobody, none of the public school students, parents, teachers, admin like it, but it's part of the law. If you you get a critical mass of of people who want a co-location somehow, they're they're able to get that. Yeah, it it just makes no sense that the school district doesn't just offer families you know, what they want, and they can stay within the public school system. If they want, if they want a different option, they go to private school. That's, that's my thing. You know, uh, we're so caught up in giving everyone choice, and there's a cost, there's a cost associated with that. And, yeah, it's, it's we, you know, we'd like these co-locations gone. It's not an efficient way to use our tax dollars. There's only so much money to be spent on education in a certain year. And when you duplicate these services, like what happens with the charter schools and the co-locations, you, you end up, no one really gets as much as they can if, if things aren't done efficiently. And the increase in inequality, uh, is there an increase in segregation with charter schools in Los Angeles? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Give me an example. There's a Goethe Charter Company, and they specialize in um, German, right? So they've found.
found a little loophole that a lot of LUSD elementary schools don't offer in German. So they said, well, we have an elementary school that offers German, right? So we're meeting some needs. You have to approve us. And what's going on is that you have really a lot of um, you know, white students going to this German school, and it's you have black and brown students in one part of the school, in the public school, and you have white students in, in another part of the school. And it's, um, it's just really um, stark contrast. I, I've been to some of their board meetings under the Brown Act. I'm able to go to some of their meetings, and it's a lot of it's a lot of wealthy immigrant parents. What I've noticed from Germany, some from Germany, and I think they've instead of coming here to America and, and putting their kids in public school and, and just getting the whole experience, they they feel like you know they want to isolate their children, and it's just it's not good. It, divides communities. And you have people like Nick Melboyne, when he comes to defend his position, he, he st likes to start off, we have one city, right? Just to kind of say, hey, I'm working with everybody. We have one city. We all need to work together. Well, if we have one city, then why do we have, you know, 80 different school districts, essentially, with all these different school systems and five school schools on one campus? The demagogy coming from the other side is just, um, it's really... It's really tricky. I'm glad people like you are looking into this because it's really it's really the opposite of one city. If they want uh, it's two cities. It's um, the haves and the have-nots, and we, we have a faction of people they want a private school experience at the public's expense, and and that's what this charter industry is all about. And the Magnolia chain run by uh, Fadula Gulen. Is that operating in Los Angeles, these Magnolia schools and uh, the Turkish uh, uh, cult kind of schools that are run in Los Angeles? Yeah, they, they are here. Um, I haven't looked into them, you know, specifically too much, but I know that the different parent groups that I associate with have written blogs about them in Los Angeles, and they're, they're quick to point out, you know, the corruptions that go on. But, yes, they're here, too, and that... Uh, Kind of further illustrate what, what I'm talking about here is it's just a way to really divide society along, you know, ethnic, religious, political grounds. And, uh, you know, just people get to find a way just to not not be a citizen, you know, and deal with the, with the entire public and sort of just uh, isolate themselves at the public's expense. And I'm talking with Sonny Lloyd. He's a uh, high school teacher, Venice High in Los Angeles. He's running for UTLA president. Uh, Sonny, what are your plans as far as changing uh, privatization? But also, what was your experience in the in the strike that happened last year? What uh, what came out of that? What did you hope? And what was the result? Well, first, with, with the charters, you know, taking them head on, and that means at the state level, repealing the charter laws, the co-location laws, you know, that has to happen. We can do that. If, if labor comes together around the state, all these school districts, all these unions, there can be a united front to get that legislation passed. The majority of Californians do not agree with the charter scam. It just has to be, they have to be given the opportunity. There was AB 1505 that came out from the strike, but really that was, just, that got so watered down. You know, we, we were promised a moratorium on charters after the strike. And that was, you know, quickly thrown to the side in, in the state assemblies. And we got this AB 1505, which it pretty much was just, uh, let's make peace with the charters. And um, we're going to give them a chance to continue to, you know, operate. And if they, the district doesn't approve, they can go to the county. They can get, you know, they can appeal. So I don't have high hopes for AB 1505. We need, we need something a lot stronger and and while that while we're working on that we're bringing communities together and we're getting them to compel the district to provide you know what they need in these schools right oh, there's a lot of people who want german well you know what we can provide you know german classes for you if you want social justice education you know things you see on these charter flyers they they try to find a little niche and to get their, their business approved. If you want a just family that really wants social justice education, you know what, we can, we can provide that. And so it's, it's me 
meeting the demand, uh, our district brags that it's the number one charter authorization authorizer in the nation on their website. They're inviting charters to come in and get approved rather than going out there, having assemblies across the city twice, three times a year to figure out what do the parents want, what do the parents need, and addressing that. Um, what, what type of you, – you wouldn't see Best Buy saying, don't come shop with us. Um, we're going to help somebody else start a business, and you can go shop with them. They're essentially – you know, killing their own school district. And we need to get anyone who's associated with that, we need to get them out of office, whether through recall, whether through mass demonstration until they step down. You know, our superintendent, Austin Bootner, has to go immediately. Um, and <clears throat> with the strike, it was, it was a letdown. You know, we, we went on strike so they would spend the money, the $2 billion reserve, they haven't spent the money. Our class size agreement is exactly what it was in 2014. And all the strike agreement said was by 2022, class sizes need to be back down to the 2014 agreement, which is something is 39 as a cap in, in high school. And 39 is not great. So some teachers, they're looking at, well, in four years from now, after the strike, we can get down to 39 kids a class. That's, um, we were looking for, you know, a massive fundamental change. Alex Caputo-Pearl said, we're, we're going to stay out on strike until we fundamentally change the conditions in these schools to attract the, the neighborhood back. One student a class for the next four years is not something that is going to uh, really excite parents to come back to public education. And another Charter issue is the, is the bonds. Uh, bonds have been passed in California. In fact, uh, Prop 39 lowered the percentage for bonds, but it seems that a lot, lot and more and more of this bond money are going to charter schools. Do you agree with that? Oh, no, absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's the same premise. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, there's not enough tax money to, to fuel their expansion, and now, now they want, you know, the taxpayer to go into debt. For them, no. I, I mean, if, I mean, bonds in and of itself—that's just a—that's a regressive measure. But then to also have that go to these, you know, private companies who are pretending to you know, educate people at a different level when they're when they're absolutely not. No, I, you know, um, if, if bonds are to be made, that they, they, their the public is paying, it, it needs to be under public oversight. And, and charters is um, charters are not overseen like like regular public schools are. And you have formed a, a network of people who are running. What is Core LA? What are what is it about? Well, it's about bringing this caucus of rank and file educators. You know, if you look through history, the rank and file they're always two to three steps ahead of the union leadership. Uh, what it, why why that is? Well, I just think the rank and file—they're dealing. They're on. They're in the trenches. They're on the front lines. So they don't have the luxury to, um, you know, make their own schedule and, and have their lunches paid for and, and meet with politicians all day. They, they, you know, it's do or die for them. So, um, like these wildcat strikes in in West Virginia and in Oklahoma, these states went out with really in right right to work states. Um, they could have gotten fired for going out. And they, they really didn't have a a union per se, like we do here in California, because they're right to work states, right? Their union rights are very limited. So the workers in those states got together on their own and, and planned these strikes. And that's what sparked the, the national movement, right? It wasn't the union leadership, it was rank and file that got out there. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, um, we're, we are trying to recre recreate that here in LA and, you know, give a big push from below uh, because we're, we're the ones that we're the ones who have the energy, have the vision. We haven't been kind of suckered into all of these opportunistic political campaigns. Our eye is on the ball because it has to be. We're, we're under the we're under the um, thumb of the system every day, and so you know we have a group of people in our union. They're running a slate of seven people. Neither none of them have been in the classroom for over six years. 
Right. And some of them haven't been in the classroom for over 12 years, and they want to lead our union. And we're saying, no, we want a new, a new breed of le leader that's coming straight out of the classroom and is willing to really fight for fundamental reform to our working conditions. And how can they get in touch with your group? Uh, we have uh, a number of different ways. Uh, we have a website, corela.education, that's C-O-R-E-L-A dot education. A very thorough website with all our, our platform, uh, Facebook, at Corela, Twitter, at Corela, under slash EDU, and we're Instagram, at Corela, under slash EDU. And if you are elected and as part of your campaign, do you plan to hook up with other teachers in the rest of California so you can fight together on these issues? Absolutely. We need to be moving toward a statewide movement, possibly a statewide strike in California. Um, you know, the charter industry, they operate on the state level, right? They're, they control the, the state assembly, the state senate, the, the functionaries in the executive branch of our of our state government is is run by the charter industry so we we can pull together and beat them at the state level but it has to be it has to be a united thing of all all the millions of teachers in california along with the custodians and security guards and everybody else we can flip the game we just have to get on the same page and you know i think utla can be the leader to get that moving with our with our masses of uh, numbers Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Work Week. This has been Sonny Lloyd. He's running for president of the United Teachers of Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us on Work Week, Sonny. Thank you, Steve.